The top stories tonight in Y News. President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. looks forward to expanding and expounding the significant strides achieved by his administration in the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Lawmakers and former groups lash out the Department of Agriculture over its alleged poor planning that caused skyrocketing prices of onion and local markets in the country. Philippine National Police Chief Police General Rodolfo Azurin Jr. urges the five-man committee to be fair, subjective in evaluating the submitted courtesy resignation of third-level officers. And a multi-story residential building in Ukraine suffers deadliest civilian attack by a Russian missile in months, killing at least 40 people. Good evening, Philippines and the world. Today is Monday, January 16, 2023. Join us in the next hour as we deliver today's top stories around the Philippines and in other parts of the world. I am William Theo. We are also seen in 1,935 satellite monitoring centers nationwide and via live streaming worldwide through the UN TV News and Rescue social media channels. I am Harding Delgado. First in the news, President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. will articulate country strides and development initiatives in the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. To tell us the details, here is Nel Maribohok live from Davos, Switzerland. Uh, yes, uh, Nel, go ahead. Yes, Will, President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. is looking forward to expanding and expounding the significant strides uh, achieved by his administration in the question and answer event at the 2023 annual uh, meeting of the World Economic Forum here in Davos, Switzerland. Aside from the question and answer with audience, President Marcos is also looking forward to the pull aside or pull away meetings on the sidelines of the WEF. I've, I've been visiting to Davos uh, several times before. Sometimes the best deals are done outside of the forum. In fact, many, if, I'd even say baka most, of the best deals are done informally. When the magdalawa magkita yung dalawa magpusip na tayo dito, then they go to the one side. Uh, tawag sa di in diplomatic uh, phraseology, they call it uh, pull away. You know, they just pull somebody away, they'll visit tayo. Here at the Davos Forum, President Marcos Jr. hopes to bring up with uh, world leaders the proposed sovereign wealth fund of the country. Based on the official schedule shared by Malacanang, the president today will uh, be attending the welcome lunch and the chief executive will also prepare for tomorrow's formal start of the forum. Around 50 heads of state will attend the five-day forum here in Davos, Switzerland. And that is our update. Back to you, Will. Yes, uh, thank you, Nel Maribohok, reporting live from Davos, Switzerland. The Commission on Elections, or COMELEC, unveiled their chairman's gallery and historical windows of the past elections. Danta Amento has the story. Former Commission on Elections, or COMELEC chairman Christian Munsod, Benjamin Abalos Sr., and Sheriff Abbas joined the unveiling of the COMELEC chairman gallery at the Palacio del Gobernador on Monday morning, January 16. Portraits of former and current chairpersons are being displayed in the gallery, the year when they were appointed and finished their term of office. You know, this brings back very good memories of the Comelec because I'm a believer in the Comelec. Napakaganda presentation ng umaga na ito, especially yung how the, the history ng ating Comelec. Nakikita dito yung pagpasa-pasa per generation ng, ng, uh, ng, uh, ng struggle ng bawat chairman. Chairman Garcia said the gallery shows how the democracy is being protected in the country for the sake of the Filipino people. Para lagi naming naaalala yung kasaysayan ng ating eleksyon sa ating bansa upang mas pagbutihin pa ng COMELEC yung paglilingkod sa ating mga kababayan at syempre para mas ma Ma, 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 mapagtanto ng ating mga kababayan din ang kahalagahan ng pagpuprotekta sa ating demokrasya. 
The poll body also opened their historical windows that contain such as the past elections. These include the first local elections in 1899 in Baliwag, Bulacan, first national elections on September 16, 1935, elected Philippine presidents, historic plebiscites, among others. Garcia explained the historical windows would remind everybody, especially Comelec personnel, of some landmark events over the electoral exercises in the country. Habang mamaya po, habang naglalakad tayo sa bawat panel, makikita niyo po ang kasaysayan ng ating halalan dito sa ating bansa. Dante Amento, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Meanwhile, Philippine National Police Chief Police General Rodolfo Azurin Jr. admitted that not all third-level officers are willing to submit courtesy resignation. On the latest count of the PNP, there are 929 or 97.48% of the 953 have filed their courtesy resignation. Lea Ilagan can tell us why. Philippine National Police Chief, Police General Rodolfo Azurin Jr. confirms that there are still 24 PNP third-level officers that are yet to submit courtesy resignations. This include two generals and five colonels who are set to retire on the first quarter of the year. General Azurin said some of them have reservations because of the fear of losing their jobs. Sinasabi nila, Sir, uh, ito lang po ang uh, karir namin na uh, uh, pinagtrabuhan namin for the last 30 years. So, nandoon yung parang agam-agam na baka naman uh, uh, kahit na alam namin na kami ay walang kasalanan, baka biglang magkamali yung, uh, yung mag-evaluate and mag-assess sa amin. So, uh, these are some of their, of their worries. Because of this, General Azurin demanded for the five-man committee to be fair, subjective in evaluating the submitted courtesy resignations. And that's why uh, we, we keep on asking the five-man committee, kung sino man po sila, na let's be fair because uh, these are the career of, uh, of our police officers. Sabi ko nga is, uh, ito na yung mga aangat, eh, ito na yung mga papalit sa amin. So that's why we are really asking for objectivity a fairness and uh, uh, just in evaluating our third-level officers. General Azurin said they are hoping that the remaining 24 third-level officers will submit their resignation before the deadline on January 31, 2023. Leia Ilagan, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The Commission on Elections, or COMELEC, will conduct a Joint Security Command Conference on Tuesday, January 17. The Armed Forces of the Philippines, or AFP, the Philippine National Police, or PNP, and the Philippine Coast Guard, or PCG, are the primary partners of the Commission. This is in preparation for the special elections in the 7th Legislative District of Cavite that will be held on February 25, 2023. Commissioner Marlon Casquejo will lead the event as Commissioner in Charge for the Special Polls. In other news, Kadiwa store in Quezon City sells white onion on Monday, January 16 after farmers directly brought their produce in the said outlets. The commodities were sold for only 170 pesos per kilogram. Department of Agriculture or DA spokesperson Asa Christine Evangelista said that they are talking with different groups of farmers for daily supply if possible. Last Friday, Kadiwa store stopped the selling of cheaper onions after the memorandum of agreement with the Food Terminal Incorporated or FTI has expired. FTI is the agency who procured the onion from the farmers. ASEC Evangelista said they are now planning for the second cycle of selling subsidized onion. Ngayong araw po, meron po silang dinalang third bag. No? Kami po ay makikipag-usap po dito sa kanila para makiusap at hikayatin po sila na magtulungan kami para po dun sa produkto nila ay mabenta sa consumer. So, the Bureau of Customs warns those who are planning to bring agricultural products in the country 
Authorities confiscated onions in the airport from passengers who tried to bring home the commodity to the country. Ray Pelayo will tell us why. Crew of airline companies caught in the airport carrying kilos of onions recently. According to the Bureau of Customs, bringing agricultural products without permit is prohibited. This is stated in the Presidential Decree 1433 wherein violators may be fined not more than 20,000 pesos or may be imprisoned at the discretion of the court. Pinagbabawal din po ito sapagkat ang ating pong plant quarantine law ay maliwanag naman po na nakasaad doon na dapat tayo po ay merong phytosanitary clearance certificate at yung dito naman po, dito sa ating counterpart, sa ating bansa, ay dapat meron pong permiso prior to importation. POC emphasized that agri-products may be carrier of pests and diseases that could affect population of local plants and animals. Nangyayari na po yan itong mga nakaraang panahon na dati walang masyadong peste dun sa ating mga pananim. Pero dahil may mga nakapasok, yun po ang nangyari. Namatay yung ibang industriya at yung ibang mga provinsya natin na dating may ganitong klase ng pagtatanim ay nawala na po. Post of overseas Filipino worker Jonelito Razona went viral that shows his luggage full of onion. Instead of chocolates, he planned to bring onions to his family when he would be back in the Philippines in April. But with the reminder of BOC, he is now double-minded of his plan. Pwede naman siguro pag-uwi ko, kung mahal pa rin, pwede ako mag-uwi siguro isang kilo, dalawang kilo na lang. Pero pag uh, ganyan, uh, marami ng ano, at uh, alam na yung sa customs na yun is uh, mahaharang kapag extra pa lang. John Elito said that the price of onion in the United States is just a dollar, much lower than the price in the Philippines that reached 700 pesos per kilogram last December. Ray Pilayo, UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. Lawmakers and farmer groups scrutinize the Department of Agriculture over its alleged poor planning that caused skyrocketing prices of onion in local markets in the country. Arlene Delgado will tell us why. Officials of the Department of Agriculture, or DA, earned the ire of several senators and onion farmer groups in today's Senate Committee on Agriculture hearing on the high prices of onion. Romel Kalingasan of San Jose Occidental Mindoro Local Government Unit lamented that the onions that they sold last year for as low as 6 pesos were marketed to Metro Manila for over 600 pesos per kilogram. Kaya talaga po, ganun na lang po ang pagkadismaya ng amin po mga magsasaka sa amin pong lalawigan, particular sa San Jose Occidental Mindoro. Sobrang pinagsamantalahan po ang, ang, ang presyo ng sibuyas. During po ng harvest season, wala po kaming nahawa, nahana, nahanap na mga slot, na mga storage facilities dahil ang sabi po, puno na. Marami po mga sibuyas ang nagkantabulukan, itinapon sa mga tabi ng kalsada. Talaga pong sobra pong pangihinayang ang, ang amin pong uh, naramdaman. Bibili sa farmers ng 6 pesos, huh? up to 15 pesos, and ngayon bibenta ng 600 pesos? Harang to, parang gaguhan na to. Kalingasan added that they were not able to sell their harvests due to lack of cold storage facilities. Senator Cynthia Villar, who chairs the committee, claimed that cartels use cold storage facilities, even those intended for onion farmers, by renting them to traders. Sa Nueva Ecija, yung cold storage, na even ari ng gobyerno at ari na binigay sa ko kooperative ng gobyerno naka-reserve sa trader hindi pinagagamit sa onion farmer kaya mag-iingat kayo kasi baka ipagpatayo kayo pero ikokontrata sa trader the DA said six cold storage facilities will be constructed this year across four top producing regions. The agency vowed to check if there were facilities that are being rented to traders. Onion farmers and lawmakers also hit the DA over its supposed poor planning in handling the country's onion supply. These include the decision to import even as the harvest season approaches. Hindi po kami naniniwalang magkata, magkaroon ng kapulangan ng sibuyas. Ang Kulang lang po ay suporta ng sa national government. 
dapat po makompute po natin yung demand and supply para sa ganon, alam po ninyo kung kailan po kayo mag-i-issue ng importation permit. Hindi yung kung kailan po kami nag-uunti-unti na mag-harvest, saka po kayo mag-i-issue. Papatayin nyo po talaga kami. The DA defended its move to import, noting that only 5,000 metric tons are expected to come in next week. The agency expects onion prices to go down to 120 to 150 pesos per kilogram in the coming months. That was the very reason na, na nag-import kasi hindi po, na, hindi po bumababa yung presyo. And we were expecting, nung, nakit, nung tinignan namin yung harvesting time, it was third and fourth week pa. And the prices were still at 500, 450 nga. We are expecting na once yung sinasabi pa nga po nila na harvesting, will come at the third and fourth week and then continue dyan sa hanggang sa April, May, talagang babagsak po siguro, hopefully, pupunta rin sa 120, 150 as in the past years. Villiers said it will study Senator Robin Padilla's suggestion for the Senate panel to subpoena in the next hearing the personalities who were allegedly involved in large-scale smuggling. Harleen Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. And for our news abroad, Ukrainian officials labeled Russia's recent missile attack on a multi-story residential building in southeastern Ukraine over the weekend as the deadliest civilian attack in months. Mavian Dog explains why live. Yes, Mav? Real after Russia's horrific missile strikes on an apartment in the city of Dnipro on Saturday, January 14, the death toll rose to 35 over the weekend, with at least 75 injured, including 13 children. About 1,700 people lived in those apartments before the strikes, and now 72 apartments were destroyed, while 230, 230 were damaged, as reported by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Ukrainian Air Force spokesman Yuri Inhat said a total of five KH-22 missiles were fired by Russia from the Kursk region. He added that Ukraine does not have a system capable of intercepting this kind of weapon designed to destroy aircraft carrier groups at sea. Meanwhile, Russia has acknowledged the missile strikes in a telegram statement but did not mention the Dnipro apartment building and has repeatedly denied targeting civilians in its war with Ukraine. At the latest, Marielle search and rescue operations are ongoing as the fate of more than 30 people who could have been in the apartments at the time of the strikes remains unknown. As of yesterday, President Zelensky reported that 39 people were rescued, including six children. Marielle? Thank you, Mavian Dog, for that live report. A Yeti Airlines passenger plane crashed on its way to Pokhara from Kathmandu in Nepal on Sunday, January 15, killing at least 68 of the 72 passengers on board. Nepalese authorities have begun identifying the recovered bodies as rescue operations continue the search for the four missing people. In a press release by the Civil Aviation Authority of Nepal, 53 of the passengers, including the four flight staff on board, were identified to be Nepali. The foreign travelers included five Indians, four Russians, two Koreans, one Irish, one Australian, one Argentinian, and one French. The bodies have been taken to Gandaki Hospital for post-mortem identification and will then be transferred to locations convenient to the families, according to Yeti Airlines. According to a local resident, the pilot tried their best to avoid hitting civilization or homes and crash in a small space beside the Seti River. It is not yet clear what caused the plane to crash. Aviation accidents are not uncommon in Nepal due to its remote runways, sudden weather changes, as well as the lack of investment in new aircraft and poor regulation. We'll share more global stories with you later, but for now, back to you, Harleen. Thank you, Marielle. To accelerate the fight against criminality, the Department of the Interior and Local Government, or TILG, launched the Safe NCRPO app alert mobile application to protect business establishments and the public. 
Meanwhile, DILG Secretary Ben-Hur Abalos plans to connect all closed-circuit television cameras in Metro Manila to the Philippine National Police. Bernadette Dinoy will tell us why. The Department of Interior and Local Government, or DILG, launched the Safe NCRPO Alert app, a mobile application for quick police assistance. According to DILG Secretary Ben-Hur Abalos, the crime rate for December 2022 in the country has decreased to 31.32%. And through the use of this app, Abels believes that this will further decrease this year. Itong app na ito, isipin mo up to the barangay, bibigyan mo. Kung merong crime, pipitutin mo lang, andyak agad, 3 minutes in Metro Manila. Ang laking epekto nito. And what is important, tinatanong kong kanina, walang pwedeng manloko. Bakit? Nakarehistro eh. Project Manager Police Lieutenant Colonel Mark Pancardas says that the accessibility to the app today is limited as it includes three implementation phases. The phase one includes the accessibility to barangay halls through authorized representative, while phase two covers the accessibility to the app of establishments such as schools, hospitals, and religious institutions. Pancardas states that all barangays in the National Capital Region, or NCR, were already registered. When asked if the public can access the app, Poncarda said, For individual residences. So, maybe at this time, tsaka na natin ilagay yan sa download para makapag-download sila. Pero ang very crucial dito is what are the mechanism that we have to do so we avoid prank malicious alert. We are very hopeful that the SIM card registration will be successful at paka naging successful po yun, madali lang po. Meanwhile, Abal has also wanted to create the connection of all closed-circuit television or CCTV cameras within Metro Manila to PNP to fight against criminality. Ang sa akin lang, sayang naman ito kung ikakanya-kanya natin. So I was requesting baka pwede ipigi bank namin to at i-connect namin lahat sa PNP. Abalos added that this move will help authorities during incidents of car chasing against criminals and assures that he would also coordinate with the Regional Peace and Order Council about the matter. Bernadette Pino, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. A send-off ceremony was held earlier today to deploy personnel from government agencies who will conduct clearing operations to sustain obstruction-free Mabuhay lanes. Metropolitan Manila Development Authority and the Department of the Interior and Local Government vowed to sustain cleanliness and orderliness on Mabuhay lanes, which serves as alternate routes for motorists. J.P. Nunez will tell us why. The Metropolitan Manila Development Authority or MMDA and the Department of the Interior and Local Government or DILG are now committed to implement the memorandum signed by the previous administration of both departments which aim to have collaborative effort to conduct clearing operations in Metro Manila. The two agencies aim to sustain an obstruction-free Mabuhay Lanes through clearing operations with MMDA personnel, National Capital Region Police, and traffic personnel from local government units. Ito po ang mga babuhay lanes, ang alternatibong daan. Uh, alam naman po natin, sobra ng sikip ng ating mga lansangan, sobrang dami na sasakyan, at kailangan, kailangan po natin linisin ito mga babuhay lanes para may mga alternatibong daan ang ating mga kababayan. According to MMDA Acting Chairman Romando Artes, once they have cleared obstructions from Mabuhay Lanes, they will have a proper turnover to barangay officials who will maintain cleanliness and orderliness in their respective areas. MMDA said there are more than 100 barangays which covers different parts of Mabuhay Lanes that they expect to be part of the campaign. However, those barangay officials who will be proven to be negligent to their duties may face charges according to Chairman Artes. Kung hindi po mangyayari yan, may monitoring team po ang DILG at MMDA at kakasuhan po administratively yung mga barangay captains na hindi mamaintain yung mga ating mga mga buhay lanes. 
Earlier today, January 16, the Interagency Clearing Operations Team conducted their first operation at Pasay City which resulted to impounding of some vehicles parked at roadside and confiscation of sidewalk vendors' items. To avoid illegal vendors, MMDA said they will be proposing to the national government to push for a permanent area for vendors in Baklaran. Makikiusap po tayo siguro sa ating Pangulo na payagan na po tayo makapagtayo dito ng permanenteng tindahan para po dito sa mga vendors dito sa Baklaran. Alam natin na itong paghahanap buhay nilang ganito ay talagang kailangang kailangan ng kanilang mga pamilya. JP Nunez, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. The Marikina City government fully reopens the Marikina Bridge after rectification of damaged part of its ramp. All types of vehicles are allowed to pass through but still prohibits heavy trucks. Asher Kadapan Jr. explains why. The local government unit of Marikina City primarily takes into consideration the safety of the public in fully reopening Marikina Bridge after being repaired from recent damages. With about 250,000 motorists plying the bridge, Mayor Marcelino Teodoro exercises abundance of cautions above any other concerns. With this, the LGU only allows light vehicles to utilize the Marikina Bridge at the time being, while heavy trucks, cargo vans, and the like are prohibited from the bridge. Uh, ito ay bahagi lamang ng uh, pag, uh, lubos na pag-iingat. Uh, sa Miyerkules ay uh, bubuksan na natin ito para doon sa mga heavy cargo truck. Uh, ang mga heavy cargo truck na hindi natin pinapayagan ay yung mga uh, nagde-deliver ng mga kalakal at uh, naglalabas ng mga produkto doon sa mga uh, heavy industrial uh, areas natin. Mayor Teodoro, however, clarifies that they already received the safety status and recommendation report. This was conducted by the Department of Public Works and Highways, Bureau of Design under the same agency, and an independent consultant. Teodoro reveals that the report shows that the structural integrity of the Marikina Bridge remains good and was not damaged. The initial findings at the findings of uh, the uh, joint inspection naman ay ligtas ngayong magagamit yung tulay ng Marikina. The Marikina LGU vows to continuously monitor 24-7 the progress of the Marikina Bridge. In the meantime, rerouting of heavy trucks is still in effect. Mayor Teodoro anticipates trucks may already be allowed to utilize the Marikina Bridge starting Wednesday. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. COVID-19 cases in the National Capital Region, or NCR, have decreased. In a Twitter post made by Professor Guido David, cases in Metro Manila decreased in seven days. As of January 14, the region's positivity rate from 5.8% went down to 3.7%. Aside from NCR, there are 10 more provinces in Luzon where COVID-19 cases declined. These are Batangas, Benguet, Bulacan, Cagayan, Cavite, Ilocos Norte, Laguna, Pampanga, Pangasinan, and Zambales. Recently, the World Health Organization, or WHO, has expressed the possibility of ending COVID-19 as a public health emergency. Health experts in the Philippines said this is already expected as COVID-19 cases, especially in the country, become controllable and manageable. Philippine Basketball Association or PBA import Justin Brownlee takes his oath of allegiance following the granting of his Filipino citizenship. Brownlee took oath at the Philippine Senate on Monday, January 16 in Pasay City, facilitated by Senate Committee on Justice and Human Rights, Chairperson Senator Francis Tolentino. Tolentino says Brownlee would just need to secure a certificate of naturalization from the Bureau of Immigration in order to fully enjoy his rights as a Filipino citizen. The Barangay Ginebra San Miguel resident import would now be eligible to join the Philippines national basketball team Gilas Pilipinas in the upcoming FIBA World Cup Asian qualifiers in February at the Philippine Arena. He is also expected to join the Southeast Asian Games in Cambodia in May.
Efficient military sales, the president of South Korea traveled to the United Arab Emirates meeting with their president. Marvi Delfin will tell us why live. Yes, Marvi, go ahead. Muriel, the president of South Korea, Yoon suk yeol was welcomed into the United Arab Emirates, or UAE, on Sunday, January 15, as he planned to hold a meeting to expand his military sales market. To build a strategic partnership with one another, the UAE has invested $30 billion in South Korea, the president of the UAE, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayan, reportedly said. The two leaders expressed both of their appreciation on Twitter, sharing their hope for the special strategic partnership, saying that it will only strengthen the two nations' interests and common goals. Seoul remains dependent on the UAE for their crude oil, which accounts for 10% of their supply, and respectively South Korea continues to supply the UAE with cars and other materials worth billions of dollars. In efforts to help the UAE with 25% of their energy demand, South Korea have also set their biggest project, which is to build atomic reactors in the Baraka nuclear power plant worth $20 billion. Meanwhile, the visit to the UAE seemed to be of importance as chairman of South Korea's leading companies like Hyundai, Samsung and the SK Group attended a luncheon at the palace. Marielle? Thank you, Marv Delfin, for that live report. <music> Filipino fans of the prestigious Miss Universe pageant still rejoice despite the elimination of Miss Philippines from the semifinals, ending the country's 12 consecutive years of placement. This after Miss USA Arbany Gabriel made history following her coronation as the first Filipino American to win the Miss Universe pageant. Miguel de Leon will tell us why. Universe is you Filipinos were elated after Miss USA's Arbony Gabriel was named the 71st Miss Universe on Saturday night, January 14, 2023, in New Orleans, Louisiana, USA. The beauty queen, fondly called by her middle name Nola, is a half-Filipina from Texas, USA. Her win gave the United States its first crown in 10 years. The fashion designer impressed the crowd and judges with her answer for the final question round using her passion in designing to have Miss Universe as a transformational platform. I would use it to be a transformational leader. It is so important to invest and others invest in our community and use your unique talent to make a difference. Filipinos in the audience rejoice with Arbany's win. Because of her perseverance and intelligence, and she's a very hardworking person. And Gabriel is indeed a proud half Filipina. I always have this feeling in me and something telling me no matter what, I should keep trying this, even though I felt like I wouldn't succeed. So it is such an amazing feeling to be standing here as the first Filipina American. Meanwhile, the country's candidate Miss Philippine Celeste Cortesi ended the 12 consecutive years semi-final placement of the Philippines. But according to Town to Travel Along, the creative director of Miss Universe, this year saw countries sending very strong candidates giving them all an equal chance to win the crown. We have a lot, a lot of strong, beautiful and very smart delegate this year. So they are very strong and have equal chance to win, I think. So we see how they perform on the stage and we send them their heart. Uh, we send them our heart and our love. Arbany will stay in New York headquarters of Miss Universe for some time before she moved to Thailand the new headquarters of the organization to perform her duties as the new Miss Universe this year. Miguel Rey de Leon, UNTV News and Rescue, New Orleans, USA. We serve the people, we give glory to God. And those are the reasons behind the news in other parts of the globe. I am Maria Latoza reporting live from Perth, Australia. Good evening.
A labor group has called for the Philippine Maritime Industry Authority and the Commission on Higher Education to double their efforts in complying with the maritime international standards. Aileen Cerudo will tell us why. Around 50,000 Filipino seafarer jobs might be at risk if the Philippines' Maritime Higher Education and Certification System is still not compliant with the International Convention on Standards of Training, Certification and Watchkeeping for Seafarers or STCW Convention. The European Commission will conclude its evaluation this coming March. According to the Trade Union Congress of the Philippines, or TUCP, the decision is crucial if the Philippines will remain under the white list for hiring seafarers. Luis Manuel Corral, Vice President of TUCP, explains that one of the problems of European vessels are the certification of Filipino seafarers. Impossible naman daw na 100% ang passing rate. Na annually, ang production mo natin ng graduates na seafarers ay mga 35,000 seafarers na Pilipino. Subalit, mga 5,000 lang ang nakaka-qualify sa kanilang standards para sumampasabang mga barko. Marina and Ched should also coordinate better, especially in finalizing a curriculum for the maritime higher education that will fit international standards. This is amid the continuous modernization of the maritime industry globally. With this, however, Coral laments that the training cost would also increase for seafarers. According to Coral, the training course cost 60 to 90,000 pesos and the seafarer would shoulder the expenses. Kailangan din i-address ng ating uh, mga ahensya dito to ensure that the costs are affordable, the training is up to European standards, at hindi fly-by-night at commercial schools ang nagpapatakbo ng mga training na ginagawa para sa ating seafarers. Marina has yet to comment on the issue. Meanwhile, the Department of Migrant Workers, or DMW, already formed an international advisory group to address the issue of non-compliance of the Philippines in the global standards of the maritime industry. The agency is also coordinating with various international shipping companies. DMW Secretary Susan Ople is also set to meet with ship-owning groups in Switzerland to ensure that the Philippines will not be delisted. Eileen Cerudo, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The Department of Migrant Workers is now looking for a possible place to be used as permanent shelter for overseas Filipino workers who sought help after experiencing difficulties and circumstances while working in Kuwait. Meanwhile, the DMW will begin the repatriation of more than 400 distressed OFWs from Kuwait before January ends. Janice and Penta will tell us why. Following the visit of the Department of Migrant Workers or DMW head level team in Kuwait to personally look into the living condition of distressed overseas Filipino workers, DMW Undersecretary Welfare and Foreign Employment Hans Leo Kakdak said that they've seen OFWs currently sheltered in Bahay Kalinga Center, which is now highly congested. According to Kakdak, 421 distressed OFWs are staying in the said shelter, which has exceeded the capacity of only 250 to 300 individuals. That is why the agency is now looking for a larger and more comfortable facility to be used as a permanent shelter for OFWs to decongest the Bahay Kalinga Center in Kuwait. Uh, without disclosing any details, uh, it may look like that we had identified a possible uh, permanent shelter uh, that can be the, the uh, migrant workers office, Department of Migrant Workers shelter here in Kuwait very soon. We're looking at really our buildings. Because uh, what we have right now uh, is sort of an upper tail uh, flat design uh, around the three-story building. Uh, three-story, uh, should I say, medium price, but now we're looking at a, a bigger facility. Aside from a permanent shelter, DMW will also begin repatriating the said 421 OFWs in the next two weeks as part of its mandate to help distressed OFWs abroad and decongest the said shelter. The four, of the 421, uh, 
we are looking at uh, the, the possibility of repatriating uh, more than half, around 300 uh, at, at the most in the next two weeks. Realistically, in the coming week, we are aiming for around 200 to 250. Uh, myself and Administrator Arnel uh, are braced uh, to, to accompany home uh, at least to be conservative and estimated uh, around 100. According to CACDAC, they are currently talking with the Labor Agency of Kuwait for the immediate repatriation of the distressed OFWs. Overseas Workers' Welfare Administration, or OWA, and its other partner agencies will shoulder the cost of repatriation of OFWs from Kuwait. Janice and Hente, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Our Kasang Bahay, as the world faces these trying times amid the pandemic caused by coronavirus, we are inviting everyone to join the Global Prayer for Humanity. Good day. I'm Brother Eli Soriano of the members of the Church of God International. I want to invite you to join us in a minute of prayer every day to pray for humanity and the whole world as we go through these perilous times. While safety measures like washing of hands and strengthening of our immune systems may help us through this horrible predicament, there is still no precaution or cure more powerful than God's mighty intervention. And we need His intervention now more than ever. It doesn't matter what religion you are in or what denomination you belong. This is an invitation for all the people around the world who cares for the future of their family, friends, loved ones, and humanity as a whole. Everybody is welcome to pray with us. For more details, you can check out the description box below. Thank you very much and I hope to hear from you soon. May God bless you. we will leave you with a word giving glory to God from the book of Romans chapter 13 verse 7 it says render therefore to all their dues tribute to whom tribute is due custom to whom custom fear to whom fear honor to whom honor Behind the news this January 16, 2023. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. I am Harley Delgado. And because we need to know, we will always ask why. I am William Theo. We serve the people. We give glory to God.